like oh. to welcome you all out here to the wilderness battlefield this morning. Five o'clock, 150 years ago, May 6th, 1864, there was a single artillery cannon report that echoed through the woods and across this field that we're standing in front of. That lone gun and that lone shot signaled the beginning of the second day of the Battle of the Wilderness. And this morning, what we are going to do uh, is walk here across the tap field um, and talk about those morning attack, uh, the morning attack on May 6, 1864. Uh, we're, there are two things that we're going to discuss this morning. Uh, one is the morning attacks, the beginning of the second day of the wilderness that occurs here along the Plank Road corridor. Uh, the other is an incident that occurs in the midst of those attacks. In fact, this incident is probably more well known than the attacks themselves. And that is uh, what became known as the lead to the rear episode. Um, very legendary event in Confederate history. Um, a huge event uh, in Texas history, as we'll find out. Um, but an event that was very important uh, <coughs> to the Battle of the Wilderness. May 6, 1864. Uh, there we go. Our lone cannon shot. Um, now our neighbors are up with us as well. So, um, but uh, we're going to spend the next couple hours. We're going to take a walk across the field here. Uh, we will be returning. And um, as we cross the field, I'd just like to uh, ask you to do a couple things. Um, first of all, f uh, follow myself as well as Frank O'Reilly. Um, we will be leading the tour. Uh, the ground, as this field is, is full of gopher holes and full of large holes and small ones, so watch your footing. Fortunately, uh, uh, daylight has arrived and we can see better. We will be crossing through some Confederate earthworks directly in front of us. Please do not walk over those mounds. There is a small opening in there. Um, we may have to move through uh, two abreast or single file, but we'll get through. Uh, so please stay uh, and cross through the earthworks at that gap. Um, but we're going to cover probably about a mile, maybe a mile and a half at the most of walking, uh, making a few stops along the way. As I said, we're going to begin uh, the day's activities uh, here at the park, focusing on the morning attacks here um, along the Orange Plank Corridor. Uh, May 5th, the previous day, for those of you who went on our programs yesterday, uh, May 5th, the battle here at the Wilderness had focused at these two locations, the Plank Road Corridor, just to our south, as well as the Orange Turnpike, uh, about two or three miles off to our north. Uh, when the fighting ended that day, uh, Lee and Grant um, had uh, grappled, uh, had locked horns, um, but neither side could really claim any sort of advantage over the other. For Ulysses S. Grant and the Union Army, uh, Grant sitting down that evening with his uh, command staff, his officers, for Grant, the fighting on May 5th was little more than a prelude to May 6th. May 6th was the day of heavy fighting. May 6th was going to be Grant's day on the battlefield. That's how Grant viewed it. May 5th was getting into position, the fighting here on May 6th, as we're going to discuss this morning, in Grant's mind, was the day in which the battle would really uh, be fought. Um, so we're going to talk about that. As I said, we're also going to talk about Robert E. Lee and uh, the famous Lee to the rear episode in which Lee rode close into battle, um, riding behind a brigade of Texans and, uh, and a regiment from Arkansas as he tried to follow them and push them into battle. Um, the fighting here at the Widow Tap Farm uh, was the battle was in the balance early in the morning on May 6th. Um, if Grant had uh, was attempting to destroy Robert E. Lee's army, if he was attempting to neutralize it, he came very close here in this field uh, 150 years ago this morning. Came very close uh, to totally uh, and, and critically um, uh, manhandling half of Robert E. Lee's army. And so Lee's presence on the battlefield that morning, his presence almost literally on the line of fire, uh, is one that uh, has gone down in history as a legendary event. And we're going to talk about what that meant for Robert E. Lee to be out here that morning and be on <coughs> the uh, firing line essentially itself. 
in the spring of 1864, um, the Confederates, the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's Army, um, were very positive. Morale was high. Um, there was no sense uh, that the war, after three years, was going against them necessarily. They still believed that they had the ability uh, to win this war. In fact, a Georgia soldier writing before the uh, campaign opened, he said, this is to be the big fight, the fight that is to restore peace to our land or to be our everlasting ruin. They were looking at 1864 as being the decision. They were either going to win or they were going to lose. And in my, their mind, uh, they felt they were going to lose. A Texan may have been on this field on the morning of May 6th, said, we are still flushed with the pleasing anticipation that this summer will cast the die for our great deliverance from Yankee tyranny. Um, even the civilians, uh, the southern civilians, for the most part, viewed 1864 as an important year, uh, but still one in which their army could win victory. Our soldiers are in the highest kind of spirits and confident of victory. All believe that this campaign will end the war. Well, there are a number of reasons they felt that way. Three years of fighting in the war, uh, up to the, or two years of, of fighting up to this point, um, the, Ar the Confederate Army had been able to win Robert E. Lee's army, victory after victory on the battlefield. Um, and so there was still that belief that even though the Union Army had brought in another general, U.S. Grant, uh, to oversee fighting here in Virginia, that the Army of Northern Virginia, the Confederate Army, would be victorious. Um, they had those victories to back them up. Another reason they were so confident was the man who was leading the army. Tremendous confidence in Robert E. Lee. Uh, the men looked up to him. On April 29th, when James Longstreet and the 1st Army Corps, uh, the Confederate Ar Army of Northern Virginia, uh, returned from Tennessee and Southwest Virginia, and they arrived uh, near Gordonsville, Virginia, Lee, on April 29th, had a review. Lee went out and reviewed the First Corps. A South Carolina newspaper wrote of that <clears throat> review. He said of the men there, a wild and prolonged cheer fraught with a feeling that thrilled all hearts ran along the lines and rose to the heavens. On all sides, expressions such as, what a splendid figure, what a noble face and head, our destiny is in his hands. A uh, South Carolina soldier wrote, if he had any doubts before as to the loyalty of his troops, this rebel yell must have soon dispelled them. The yell that the men gave in Longstreet's Corps as Lee reviewed them. Um, a chaplain who was there, one of Lee's aides said, does it not make the general proud to see how his men love him? Not proud, it awes him. And one of the colonels from uh, a Georgia regiment, the 31st Georgia wrote, he is the only man living in whom they would unreservedly trust all power for the preservation of their independence. So for the soldiers, many of them in the Army of Northern Virginia, and for civilians, Robert E. Lee embodied their hope. Their hope for success and uh, their hope for victory and independence. And so that trust, that loyalty, that hope, uh, that was an extremely powerful thing. And there's, there can't be any doubt that Lee recognized that and understood that. And that's very important in understanding when Lee decides here on the morning of May 6th to go out in front, to go on to the battle lines, and his men see him, what that meant to them uh, and what it meant to him. So we're going to talk about those things, but uh, to get to that point, we've got to bring the troops to the field on the morning of May 6th. After that single cannon shot was fired at 5 a.m., the Union attacks. The Union uh, would be the first to step forward that morning on this end of the field. Grant had assembled a tremendous attack force, tremendous attack force, um, to essentially try and destroy Lee's uh, right flank, this end of the line. And in order to uh, bring those uh, troops to the field, and explain what exactly Grant's plan was, how he brought it together. We're going to move to our next stop and turn it over to Frank. So if you follow us, we'll head to the next stop. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Happy anniversary. Ha, <laughs> ha,
because it's a much happier anniversary for us to gather here this day than it was 150 years ago at this very moment. Things were all leading up to this moment. May 1864, you already heard the stakes and how much everybody has come to rely upon Robert E. Lee as the living embodiment of the Confederacy and the Confederate cause. On May 4th, the Union Army crossed the Rapidan River into the wilderness. At the same time, William Tecumseh Sherman started on the long road to Atlanta. At the same time that Franz Siegel is moving through the Shenandoah Valley, destined to go to Newmarket. At the same time, Benjamin Franklin Butler is moving up the James River and heading towards Bermuda 100. The Grand Offensive is all-encompassing, all across the nation. But the eyes of the world are on Virginia. This is the gauge by which folks will judge the progress, the success, or the failure of the war. And because of that, Ulysses S. Grant is with the Army of the Potomac, the most high-profiled, most political army of this entire conflict. For the first time ever, Robert Edward Lee and Ulysses Simpson Grant are going to pair off in battle, the two great captains, head to head for the first time. And their meeting occurred in a white heat drama that started 150 years ago yesterday with a meeting encounter on two parallel roads in the middle of the wilderness. Right beside us here, the Orange Plank Road, an east-west road that connects Orange, Virginia to the west to Fredericksburg, Virginia to the east. Just two and a half miles to your right, as you heard from Eric, is the Orange Turnpike that does ostensibly the same thing. Confederate forces on both those roads set out to intercept the Union Army and prevent them from driving southward towards Richmond, prevent them from ever escaping the wilderness. If they could successfully move on these east-west roads, they could interdict the Union force, which was moving from north to south. If they could stop them and block those roads, the Union Army only had several responses and none of them necessarily positive. The Union Army could turn and fight in this awful nest of thickets and fight at a grave disadvantage. Though they had an army of 125,000 men paired off against a Confederate army of 55,000, they could not bring their full force to bear in this woodland. Number one, their preponderance of artillery would be negated by the fact that there are very few fields that they could use for a field of fire. Secondly, they had a 13,000-man cavalry corps that could not maneuver through these woods. And even for the infantry itself, they would find it very difficult to mass their forces and bring in major combinations. To have them maneuver on road networks is one thing. To have them maneuver in a field like this is one thing. But to maneuver through the woods is an entirely different proposition. So, the Confederates could hope to limit the battle towards the road corridors, to <coughs> limit it to the spot where their numbers were equal, if not superior, to the forces that they would be fighting against. And on May 5th, yesterday, those Confederates set out to engage the Union Army. What they didn't realize is that General Grant wasn't maneuvering towards Richmond to capture Richmond. He was maneuvering towards Richmond to lure the Confederate defenders out of their strong entrenchments to the west of us around a place called Mine Run. To bring them into the open and to bring them to battle and crush them with force. When Robert E. Lee took the initiative, he willingly came out from behind those earthworks. He came out into the open, and the Union Army accepted the challenge, and the battle began yesterday. It was terrible. It was dreadful. General A.P. Hill's Confederate Third Corps marched down this road 
and got within eyesight of their objective of blocking the North-South Brock Road. But they were thwarted at the last second by a Union Six Corps division of George Washington Getty. Getty bought enough time for the other Union forces to gather, concentrate on our front. General Winfield Scott Hancock's large Second Corps would arrive, beef up the Union forces, and the fighting would even become more deadly, more intense. And A.P. Hill found himself beset to the point where he would have to fight not to succeed, but to ward off defeat. He was fighting just for self-preservation. And his lines, by the end of the day, had been pushed back to the very edge of this field where we began this morning. And that's where they spent their night. The night of May 5th, saw the Confederate Third Corps in disarray. According to um, one South Carolinian, he said that night came at last, putting an end to the actual battle, but in fact, increasing the confusion and danger of the scene. It was confidently expected that Longstreet, with Kershaw's and Fields and Anderson's divisions, would relieve us by daylight. And therefore, it was not considered necessary to reform the lines. Besides, the nature of the ground, the intense darkness, the close proximity to the enemy, rendered it almost impractical to do that anyway. So the Confederates just proceeded to lay down and collapse in spot. Now, part of the reason is our terrain. Part of it was the night. Part of it was their enemy. But the South Carolinian also alludes to another very critical element, an expectation that General James Longstreet's Confederate First Corps was going to come to this place and relieve them to exchange. In truth, the Confederates have been moving not only on two parallel roads, the Orange Turnpike and the Orange Pike Road, but they were moving on three parallel roads. One further to the south, the Catharpin Road. But in the course of May 5th, A.P. Hill's Corps has been so badly used up that Robert E. Lee has determined that he would divert Longstreet to the north end of the battlefield, bring him here to the Plank Road, shorten up the battlefield, consolidate his forces, and replace A.P. Hill directly with Longstreet's forces. The expectation, the hope, the anticipation was that he would be here sometime after midnight. But sometime after midnight is a wide open door. You and I standing here right now is sometime after midnight. <laughs> now, they were expecting them to come here and that would be a logical expectation if we were in open country if we were on well-grounded road networks. But we are in the wilderness, and his corps is going to have to invent a road that will take them from the Catharpin Road to the Plank Road at Parker's store, about two miles ahead of you. They're going to have to not only invent a road, they're going to have to invent a road in the middle of the night, in the wilderness. Worst case scenario. Now. If we're looking at this from Robert E. Lee's standpoint, we're not only consolidating our lines in anticipation of more fighting on May 6, but we are putting the fresh troops on this sector of the line. We are beefing up this end of the line. Robert E. Lee anticipates that May 6 will be a day not of defense, but offense. And that the trigger of this would be James Longstreet, who would be leading this attack to a decisive conclusion. Across the way, the Union High Command is also planning on the evening of May 5th in anticipation of this morning. As far as they are concerned, Ulysses S. Grant, the nominal commander of the Army of the Potomac, George Gordon Meade, and the Corps commanders gathered around Elwood as they discussed their day's events and exper experiences, they realized that the fighting to the north of us, along the turnpike, around Saunders Field, has turned into a bloody stalemate. The lines are static. The Federals cannot push forward, nor can the Confederates. 
but on the southern end of the battlefield where Hancock was located, he had been at the Brock Road and had pushed the Confederates back almost a mile and a half to two miles. This was a front that promised some success. In comparison to the north end of the battlefield, this was the place that the Federal Army could sense an opportunity. So they too were planning to launch an offensive on the southern end of the field. They were looking at attacking right down the length of the Plank Road with the Union Second Corps. It was going to be reinforced by George Washington Getty's division of the Sixth Corps. And coming out of the north, heading at us almost at a 90 degree angle, would be James Wadsworth's division of the Fifth Corps. And as this battle proceeds, it would be reinforced by an entire Army Corps, the Ninth Corps, under Ambrose Everett Burnside. So if you think about this Union plan, it encompasses two entire Army Corps and elements of two other Army Corps and in truth, elements of every single Army Corps on the battlefield. That is a massive assault that if they were able to pull it together, would make Pickett's charge look like a Sunday school picnic. And unlike Pickett's charge, they're not going to be doing it across grasslands. They're going to be doing it in the wilderness. They're not all going from point A to point B but they are starting at divergent points, and all of them are going to meet at one point, the point of contact, the point of battle. That is one of the trickiest propositions to put out in a military world at any time, even today. But to do it in the 1860s, and to do it in the woods, and to do it at five o'clock in the morning is bold and daring at its extreme. But the Union High Command want to get a jump start. They want to get this thing going. They want to be the actors and make Robert E. Lee the reactor. Fully aware that if you leave Lee to his own devices, he will seize the initiative. And so we have two offensive commanders who have spent the night planning for this. The only people that haven't planned for this is A.P. Hill and his Confederate Third Corps. Those men were exhausted. They were in disarray. And in truth, they were not prepared to fight any further. <coughs> At one point, one of the division commanders, Harry Heath, came back here to talk to General A.P. Hill. As they met in this field, it was interesting what transpired. According to General Heath, A.P. Hill was glowing in praise for him. He said at this point, your division has done splendidly today. Its magnificent fighting is the theme of the entire army. And he was content to leave it at that. But Heath was not. Heath explained in answer, yes, the division has done splendid fighting. But we have other matters to attend to just now. We can't rest on our laurels. The battle is still in our midst. And as he explained, the troops are completely mixed up out here. There are two Confederate divisions, under Harry Heath himself and also under Cadmus Marcellus Wilcox, one of the brilliant names of the Confederate Army. <laughs> Just rolls. Their two divisions are inextricably mixed. Their units are all over the place. And as he wanted, to explain at this moment, he said, let me take one side of the road and form a line of battle, and Wilcox take the other side and do the same. We are so mixed and lying at every conceivable angle that we cannot fire a shot without firing into each other. A skirmish line could drive both my division and Wilcox's, situated as we are right now. We certainly will be attacked in the morning. <coughs> So, this is a good anticipation of what is going on, and it's a good assessment of what's happening here around the edge of Widow Taps before dawn. A.P. Hill doesn't share that interest. A.P. Hill's answer 
is that General Lee's orders were to let the men rest as they were. And that General Longstreet would be up by or soon after midnight and would form in the rear of the line before daylight, which would mean that they were anticipating that they would form up right where we are right now. And then that Confederate line below us would fall back behind them and go into reserve, and the front line of the Confederates, the jump-off spot for their new offense, would be right where we're standing. So, Harry Heath didn't feel comfortable about that. In fact, he's going to visit this field no less than three times that night to appeal to straighten out the line, to separate the commands, to entrench. And every time he was told, it's not a problem, Longstreet will be up. It's Longstreet's problem. <laughs> it's very short-sighted because even if the Third Corps was going to be relieved and First Corps was going to take the front, it would behoove the Third Corps for their own defense to have an insurance policy until that moment. It would also behoove the First Corps to inherit a line that's already established. But in truth, A.P. Hill is a very sick and distracted <laughs> man at this point, and this is not his finest hour. On his third visit to this field, he was told most curtly by A.P. Hill, damn it, Heath, let the men rest. And there the matter lies, in truth. 150 years ago, right now, this moment, the sound of gunfire and cannon permeate everything around you. But it is not the sound of Longstreet. It is the sound of Hancock. Because dawn is coming, and Longstreet is not here. But Hancock is. And that is where everything hangs in the balance at this moment. So as we survey our area, we look at where we are, and what's going to transpire here. We should familiarize ourselves with our ground, with our setting, to understand the great acts that are going to occur here on this stage. And with that, I'm going to have a, turn this over to Eric, and we're going to move on out towards the Widow Taps homestead. As Frank said, we're standing here in the tap field, and it's important to understand, you know, our surroundings. Um, the field that we're in uh, was occupied by the widow Tap and her family uh, here in 1864. When we look at the wilderness, of course, we think of the battlefield as being the woods. That's where the bulk of the fighting did occur along the roadways and in the woods. But we do have fields that dot them. We spent some time yesterday in Saunders Field. Some of you probably stopped at Higgerson Field. We're now down here at the Tap Field. In the wilderness, these fields did become magnets um, because obviously in order to command during the Civil War, you had to be able to see what you were commanding. Um, and in the woods, it became extremely difficult. If you can only see 10, 15 yards in any direction, um, it's very difficult to be able to take charge and direct, if you're an officer, your command. So in these fields, you have the visibility. In these fields, you have the artillery, the cannon, uh, with a uh, line of sight to fire. And so the Widow Tap Field, just like Saunders Field, just like Higgerson Field, became very important locations um, here uh, during the Battle of the Wilderness. And the Tap Field that we're standing in was about 35, maybe 40 acres, um, and it was on the north side of Orange, Tur of Orange Plank Road. We've been seeing the cars this morning, the commuters heading to work, going down Orange Plank Road today. Um, and uh, so we're on the north side. It was about 35 to 40 acres, um, rectangular in shape. It's access running along, uh, the long access running along Orange Plank Road. And this is where Robert E. Lee chose to make his headquarters. It was also A.P. Hill's headquarters. Uh, on the evening of uh, May 5th into the morning of May 6th, um, A.P. Hill's headquarters was apparently at the right end of uh, Pope's artillery line, which we'll talk about at the next stop. 
Um, but along the road, um, the fields were obviously also areas in which the officers could be found. Their ability to send their couriers out and for couriers to be able to find them. And so this was also Robert E. Lee's headquarters. Lee made his headquarters here in the Taft field uh, beginning on May 5th. The Tafts who lived here did not actually own the property. When we look at um, house places and domestic sites in the wilderness, we've got two ends of the spectrum. Uh, we have the Lacy's who lived up at Elwood, 3,300 acres of plantation, um, uh, scores of slaves working the uh, property. Down here, it's the other end of the spectrum. We have the Tafts uh, trying to eke out a living, and they don't own the property. They are actually tenants of the Lacy's. James Horace Lacy, who owned Elwood, owned the tap field that we're in now. His uh, ownership of property extended this far. Unlike Elwood, in the, in the large, uh, gorgeous plantation house down here, uh, the taps, they lived in a uh, very simple, one story, perhaps a loft, uh, log cabin that at best had two rooms. Um, and that cabin stood just about where we are now. Uh, a little ways into the woods uh, behind us. So this was essentially the tap uh, uh, property and their house here. They had a cherry and apple orchard that was between the cabin and the Orange Plank Road. Uh, there were two additional outbuildings on the property, corn crib and a log stable. Unlike Lacey, uh, their landlord, uh, the buildings here, all three of them in 1860 were valued at only $90. Um, so this is very, very poor. Uh, farming down here, and that is part part of the reason we have so many uh, few fields in the wilderness. As you've probably heard, if you've been to the programs over the last few days, this area, the wilderness, part of its existence is due to the depletion of the soil. Uh, tobacco farming here in the 1700s, the uh, iron industry uh, utilizing the woods, and so because th this area was known as the poison fields, uh, the very difficult uh, inability to actually be able to farm this land. And so for individuals like the Taps or families like the Taps, it was very hard going, not very profitable. Um, in, the 18, in 1850, the family consisted of Vincent and his wife Catherine, their three daughters and one son. Six people living in this tiny little uh, one to two room cabin. Um, by 1860, Catherine was a widow, thus the widow Tapp farm in the name of the uh, the property that we use today. She was living there with uh, her three daughters, son, and now a granddaughter, and then there was an a, uh, unrelated, uh, not a relation, laborer living in the uh, house as well. Uh, Catherine Tapp's personal property in 1860 was only $120. Um, that's what she was worth compared to James Horace Lacey um, and uh, his thousands of dollars of uh, net worth up, uh, up at the, uh, the main house uh, at Elwood. Uh, the war kind of time condition. By the time the armies arrived here, uh, just like most farms in Virginia, uh, it had fallen on hard times. Um, it was hard enough to make a living for the taps here before the war, it, very important once the war began. Uh, one of Jeb Stewart's staff officers, uh, Alexander Bodler, when he arrived here uh, during the wilderness, he described the field that we're standing in now. He said it was an old field, scantily covered with sedge grass and the scattered growth of stunted pines. Uh, so essentially, the field had gone foul, uh, was not being farmed. The taps were not uh, making much of any living here. Uh, Catherine was 59 years old in 1864. Um, and probably the most important person to our story on the property here is her granddaughter. Uh, her granddaughter, uh, who was listed in the census uh, as Eliza, uh, four years old at the time, uh, went by Feeney. We're not quite sure where the name Feeney comes from. Um, but after the war, one of uh, George Meade's staff officers, Theodore Lyman, came through this area uh, in 1866, April of 1866, on a visit through the area, ride through the area. Theodore Lyman wrote, the Tapp family is still extant. This is two years after the fighting here. And an old woman and three daughters, all in a miserable log cabin, with a granddaughter named Trifini Bermudi Tap. Uh, Trifini Bermudi Tap. Don't know if that was her real name, um, but uh, perhaps if it was, uh, that is where uh, uh, Feeney came from. 
Lyman said, here in the field was plainly a hot place, as there was a shell through the tap house. So the tap house had taken some damage. But the taps were not here on May 6, 1864. They'd been here the previous day, May 5th. Uh, Feeney, in 1944, um, well, actually in 1944, um, her recollections of what occurred here during the Battle of the Wilderness were printed in the local newspaper. She had sat down in the late 1930s with Ralph Happel, who was one of the first Park Service historians here. Uh, tremendous opportunity for a historian to be able to sit down with a participant and interview them um, about what happened. And uh, Ralph wrote the newspaper article and he said that as Feeney explained what happened on May 5th, she, her grandmother, uh, her mother, her aunt, here in this cabin when the Confederate Army arrived, when A.P. Hill coming down the road, Plank Road, arrives here at the TAP uh, property. Um, according to Ralph, uh, Feeney told him that the first thing about the battle, she used to say, was the thunder. Uh, a big storm was coming up and she was afraid. Remember, she's about four or five years old at this point. Um, and this is her, uh, her recollection. The thunder, as she understood much later, was not that of God, but man's terrible thunder of guns. The next thing was the sight of large men in gray, presumably A.P. Hill and his staff, who suggested that a battle was imminent and the Tapp family leave at once for the rear. It was gathered by Feeney that a lot of very bad men in blue were going to get a whipping. And she knew why, too. They were throwing pebbles in the spring. That's what she always got a whipping for. As the women, Feeney, her mother and grandmother, hurried westward on the plank road to the rear in safety, the storm that Feeney feared broke. Large drops hit the road and dust spurted up the way it does when the first raindrops fall before the ground gets wet. It was much later that the realization of the truth came. The drops were mini balls from the muskets of the Yankee soldiers, a ver veritable rain of death through which the women safely passed to a haven at the Pulliam Place near Parker's store. So the Feeney's, uh, Feeney and her family, uh, her uh, widowed grandmother, um, her mother, are here when A.P. Hill arrives on May 5th, 1864, and they are being hustled to the rear, ordered out of danger. Um, Feeney became a local legend here after the, after the war. Uh, she lived here on the property um, until her death in 1944. Uh, she purchased the property in 1890 for $62 from the Lacy's, from Jan uh, James Horse Lacy and his, uh, his family for $62, uh, $62, and Feeney was a, sort of an attraction in this part of uh, Spotsylvania County. Uh, not a very, very refined woman, um, uh, according to those who came to visit, and uh, I was fortunate to talk to somebody who actually would tour the battlefields in the 1930s and 40s and came here and would meet Feeney, she would tell stories of the battle. Uh, but in exchange for her stories, she ex uh, accepted as payment two tins of Prince Albert tobacco and a brand new corn cob pipe. <laughs> so that was Feeney's uh, payment for telling stories, was uh, tobacco and a new corn cob pipe. Uh, interestingly enough, in the 1930s, uh, Feeney was arrested here. Um, she was fined $50 for selling alcohol to the local Civilian Conservation Corps boys that were uh, <laughs> here. The, and uh, her still was confiscated. So uh, Feeney, who had survived the battle here, had hustled off the property. Uh, was uh, producing alcohol uh, here in the 1930s and was arrested for it. But uh, she died in 1944, but we do have recollections of uh, her recollections of what occurred. But this was a very um, dangerous place, the Taft Field. Not only on May 6th, as Frank has described, the Union attacks are coming forward. They're going to be pushing on toward the field here. This is uh, Robert E. Lee, A.P. Hill's uh, headquarters here on the Taft uh, Farm. But the previous day, May 5th, it was an extremely dangerous place for Robert E. Lee. Uh, he had established his headquarters here upon arriving, and it was here uh, that according to those who witnessed it and were participants to it, uh, Lee, uh, along with A.P. Hill and Jeb Stewart, almost were captured um, here on the Widow Tap Farm. Um, as they arrived, they had pulled off the road and apparently under the shade of an orchard tree uh, were resting somewhere um, on the field. Uh, Colonel William H. Palmer of A.P. Hill's staff wrote about what had happened. 
It was Lee Hill, William Nelson Pendleton, Chief of Artillery, and Jeb Stewart having this conference under a tree. Uh, Palmer said that uh, suddenly a force of the enemy in skirmishing order came out of the woods on the left, presumably off to the north, coming out of the woods on the left. General Lee rap um, walked rapidly off towards Heath's troops, presumably heading toward the road, calling for Colonel Taylor, his adjutant general. General Stewart stood up and looked the danger squarely in the face. General Hill remained as he was. We were within pistol shot when, to our surprise, the federal officer gave the command right about and disappeared into the timber, as much alarmed at finding himself in the presence of Confederate troops as we were at their unexpected appearance. Alexander Bobler, who was here, wrote another description of what had happened, the near uh, the encounter or con uh, near confrontation between Lee and his uh, generals and these uh, Union soldiers who ventured out of the woods. Bobler said, who had been napping um, after they pulled off the road, he's one of Stewart's staff members. He had laid down apparently under the tree. How long I had been napping, I don't, kn I know not. Perhaps not more than ten minutes. When I was startled by the sound of horses galloping past me. And on rising, I saw all the generals in full flight from the field, followed by their respective staffs and officers. General Lee was galloping toward the wood, and A.P. Hill on foot was running in the same direction. I was not too long in discovering the cause of the confusion, for in looking behind me toward the left, I saw a party of the enemy in the edge of the woods, whose bayonets gleaming in the sunlight were decidedly too close to be comfortably contemplated. And to make matters worse, my horse, having disengaged his bridle rein from the bush to which I had uh, carelessly hitched it, had strayed some little distance from me, and in the direction of the intrusive Yankees, where he was standing ready to dash off after the rest of the party and leave me in the lurch. So cautiously, keeping my horse between myself and the enemy, and speaking to him as gently as I approached, he allowed me to take hold of the dangling rein, and I leaped into the saddle and galloped off. If they referring to the Yankees, if they had known that General Lee and several of his chief commanders were within 200 yards of them and utterly unprotected, they could with one volley have irreparable, uh, have done irreparable injury to the Confederacy. So two different accounts, um, but nonetheless Lee, Hill, Pendleton, uh, staff members, Jeb Stewart, gathering here in the Widow Tap Field uh, on May uh, 5th and Union troops uh, had filtered into the field to the north uh, and who knows, potentially could have bagged the commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia. So that was a perhaps an omen uh, for what would happen the next day, May 6th, that this was a dangerous place uh, for Robert E. Lee and this would be a dangerous place. Um, and that danger is going to be more troops, federal troops, a day later who are going to spill out into this field and Lee finds himself staring face to face uh, with the federal enemy on the battlefield. So with that, if you follow us, we'll head on to the next stop and we'll bring the Federals to the field and uh, the Confederate response.